this is one of the service departments I always look forward to visiting. Norm and Marty in a huddle back there are usually worth listening to. Let's find out what the conference is all about. Say, Norm, what are you and Marty up to this beautiful fall day? I guess you might say that we're plotting against the cold weather that's just around the corner, Tech. Actually, we were just comparing notes on winter season service and sort of picking each other's brains on solving or preventing cold weather starting and performance problems. Sounds timely and interesting, Norm. Now tell me, Marty, is this a private party or is it open to the public? You didn't have to ask that, Tech. You know you and your master technician friends are always welcome to listen to our opinions and experiences. Matter of fact, I hereby nominate you to moderate this seasonal service gab fest. I'll just take you up on that and kick this session off by asking you how much importance you attach to battery service. The battery sure isn't as frequently a cause of cold weather problems as it used to be. Thanks to the alternator, 12-volt electrical system, multi-viscosity oils, and a lot of other design improvements. However, the battery's specific gravity test still heads the list of things to check on every tune-up or winter service job. Now, that's because a low battery is bound to cause cold weather starting problems. A fully charged battery is good insurance against won't start complaints. While I'm at it, I make sure the battery is clean and make sure there are no leaks or cracks in the sealing compound that would promote excessive self-discharge. This is particularly important on high mileage and older cars. Clean, tight battery cables are always important. On older cars, I take the cables off, clean the battery posts and the cable terminals. After you reconnect the cables, coat the battery posts and cable terminals with light grease. That's good insurance against corrosion. And the right capacity battery is good insurance against starting trouble. Underpowered bargain batteries don't have the capacity to deliver a hot spark and good cranking speed in extremely cold weather. Good point, Tech. Too often I find an underpowered battery in an old car where a little extra capacity is what the owner should have bought. Even for a relatively new car, a heavy-duty battery is a good idea under extremely difficult starting conditions. It seems to me that that should just about take care of the discussion on the importance of the battery. Uh, unless you have something to add, Norm. I would like to express an opinion on a closely related subject, the battery charging system. Any time I run into a dead battery, a low battery, or a chronic case of hard starting, I make it a point to check out the entire charging system. <laughs> you might say a dead battery calls for a scientific autopsy on the charging system. That's about the size of a tech. I don't mean to suggest that a soup-to-nuts test of the charging system is a seasonal service that should be performed on every car that comes in. But I am convinced that the charging system should be tested any time a customer has battery trouble. Amen, Norman. And I'd like to add, the battery, the field circuit, the charging circuit, the alternator, and the voltage regulator are all part of the charging system. Test them all, test them in order, follow the manual. No shortcuts, please. On the other hand, if the battery is okay, but hard starting is the complaint, I recommend running a cranking voltage test to find out if input voltage to the ignition coil is high enough to ensure good coil output when the battery's under a cranking load. Now, here are a few clues I get from cranking voltage and speed. If the battery is okay but cranking speed seems slow, I check out the entire cranking circuit before I worry about the primary ignition circuit. On the other hand, if cranking speed is good, but the cranking voltage test shows that primary ignition voltage is low. I check out the primary ignition circuit resistance. Now, this may sound kind of elementary, but it's a mighty important step in tracking down hard start or won't start problems. Inspecting ignition points for evidence of burning or excessive pitting is kind of fundamental too, Marty. But ignition point condition, alignment and spacing, is a service that isn't always done as carefully as it should be. That's for sure, Tech. For instance, always pull the distributor to install ignition points so you can check out the advanced curves, test the breaker arm spring, align points properly and gap them accurately. 
It's next to impossible to install and align points properly without pulling the distributor. A thin film of special Mopar or Crico distributor cam lube will cut down rubbing block wear. Too much lube or the wrong kind of lube will cause burned ignition points. Next, I'd like to get in my two cents worth on condensers. The condenser has an extremely long service life, and condenser failure is seldom a cause of ignition point trouble. If the car can be started at all, you can bet the condenser hasn't failed. On the other hand, an off-brand condenser that isn't matched to the ignition coil and the ignition system will affect engine performance and can cause premature point failure. Norm's right. And that means there isn't any good reason to replace a condenser unless it's failed completely or was the wrong capacity to start with. Here are the common causes of premature point failure. Excessive oil or lube, the wrong kind of cam lube, a point gap that's too close, or high voltage because the voltage regulator's set too high. Now, how about a word to the wise on secondary ignition problems, Marty? Coming up next, Tech. Present-day ignition systems put out as much as 20,000 volts. Now, if that kind of voltage gets half a chance, it will jump to ground before it gets to a spark plug. That's why the higher ignition voltage requirements of modern high-compression, high-speed engines make it necessary to pay particular attention to the condition and servicing of the secondary ignition system. We usually think of secondary ignition problems, particularly ignition cable and nipple problems, in connection with wet weather starting troubles. I've got a word or two to say on that score, Marty. You fellas up here in the snow country got to remember that in some parts of the country, the winter season is the wet season. It's also important to remember that north, south, east, or west, marginal secondary or primary ignition performance may provide satisfactory starting in hot, dry weather, but serious starting problems in damp or cold weather. I'll buy that, Tech. And a combination of damp, cold weather is real trouble for a faulty ignition system. Now, I don't have any hard and fast rule on where you ought to start looking for trouble in the secondary system or what you should do first to prevent trouble. I guess everything is important. And it doesn't make much difference where you start as long as you hit everything. Always assume the coil tower has a film on it that might lead to carbon tracking and clean it. Then, inspect it for cracks or other damage. Also, inspect the cable nipple, the cable, and the cable terminal. The eraser end of an ordinary lead pencil makes a good tool for cleaning out the inside of the coil tower and, of course, the distributor cap towers. This is particularly important on high mileage and older cars. Clean and inspect every spark plug cable and nipple. Unless every cable is in perfect condition and properly routed, you're asking for starting trouble in cold, damp days. When you connect a timing light, use an approved adapter. Don't ever use a timing light or other test equipment that requires puncturing or that may damage the insulation of the high-tension ignition cables. Speaking of cables, I'm sold on the superiority of the high-tension ignition cable sets we're now getting from the Chrysler Parts Division. Anytime I replace nipples or cables, I stick to the recommended replacement parts. Here are a couple more tips worth remembering. Don't slide a nipple on the cable. If you do, you'll reduce the effectiveness of the nipple-to-cable seal. Whenever you install a cable and nipple, pinch the cable and nipple to release trapped air and push the cable terminal all the way into the coil or distributor tower. I've seen cases where this wasn't done and the nipple and cable popped up, leaving a poor contact and a poor seal. I'm sure that by now, everyone should know how important it is to make sure the distributor cap is clean, inside and out. Yet, I still run into starting and wet weather performance problems that are caused by a cap that hasn't been properly cleaned. There's only one way to clean a cap right. Get the cap off the car where you can scrub inside and out in a warm solution of a non-inflammable household detergent. When a cap is clean, rinse it with clean hot water. Give it a shake or two and let it air dry. It'll dry in a jiffy if the rinse water's hot. Don't use compressed air. It may contain oil. Of course, after you clean the cap, be sure and inspect it. 
And that seems to just about cover most of the ignition system. If someone will turn the record over, we can find out what Marty and Norm have to say about getting the fuel system set for the winter season. Norm, it seems to me you've let Marty do most of the talking so far. Suppose you kick off the second half with a few well-chosen words on the fuel system. Okay, Tech. I think the best way to cover carburation service highlights is to tell you about some of the most common mistakes I've seen made and uh, a few mistakes I've made myself. To begin with, I've seen far too many cases where the carburetor came in for a complete overhaul when a minor adjustment would have taken care of the starting or performance problem. I'm sure the choke doesn't get out of adjustment or cause trouble half as often as some people think it does. Exactly, Tech. It's seldom necessary or desirable to adjust the choke unless someone else has already misadjusted it. Instead of pulling the choke out of its well at the slightest provocation, make sure the choke can be fully closed manually. Simply open the throttle to release the fast idle cam and the choke linkage and use light pressure to close the choke valve. If it doesn't close easily and fully, then it's time to look for the cause of the choke trouble. I hate to bring up a point we've covered so many times before, but it's still important. On past models with a vacuum piston, make sure the piston is free. Also, make sure the choke valve shaft and bushings are free of gum and deposits. A sticking choke valve shaft is just as apt to cause trouble as a sticking piston. And this brings up another important point. Don't forget to flush the choke shaft and bushings periodically with carburetor cleaner on 64 and 65 models with a vacuum diaphragm setup. Uh, I didn't mean to steal a ball from you, Norm. Uh, suppose you take it from here. Okay, Tech. A bind in the choke linkage or binding of the choke itself in its well are also common reasons why the choke valve won't close fully. To find the trouble, disconnect one link at a time until you find the cause. Whatever you do, don't start bending rods indiscriminately or straightening rods to eliminate a bind until you've checked the service manual or looked at another carburetor of the same model. I've seen a number of cases where bent rods or linkage interfered with choke and fast idle operation. I wonder if all technicians realize the importance of the vacuum kick adjustments, Tech. I don't know, Norm. But I'll bet everyone out there will be interested in hearing your ideas on the subject. Based on my experience, I'd say that vacuum kick misadjustment is more apt to cause choke trouble than the choke itself. Now, for example, if the vacuum kick is adjusted so that the vacuum diaphragm pulls the choke open too far, the choke may not fully close. Of course, that'll cause starting trouble in cold weather. A vacuum kick that's too wide may not be much of a problem in warm or hot weather. However, when it gets cold, the car may not start or will be hard to start. And then during warm-up, the mixture will be too lean, causing frequent stalling. Two wrongs don't make a right. Don't try and correct this condition by adjusting the choke. Correct the vacuum kick adjustment. Of course, if the vacuum kick is misadjusted so the kick opening is too narrow, well, the starting and warm-up mixture will be too rich. This would cause the engine to roll erratically and stall frequently from over-choking. Here are some suggestions on adjusting the vacuum kick. You must apply at least 10 inches of vacuum to the vacuum diaphragm when adjusting or measuring the vacuum kick. If you don't have a vacuum pump handy, use the manifold vacuum from the car in the next bay. All you need is a long length of vacuum hose. Any engine that'll run will probably pull more than 10 inches of vacuum. Any more good vacuum kick suggestions, Norm? Sure, Tech, I'm loaded with free advice. For example, be sure and use 64 model vacuum kick specs for 64 models and 65 specs for 65s. There's a lot of difference between the two. I don't try to remember them. I use the service manual. Not long ago, I had a job that was over-choking. I checked and rechecked everything, including the vacuum kick adjustment. I finally found out that the vacuum diaphragm was leaking. Since that experience... I leak test every vacuum diaphragm before I test or readjust the vacuum kick. Why don't you explain that test, Marty? All you do is push the vacuum diaphragm stem to the fully retracted position. Then, 
Put your finger over the tiny hole in the end of the vacuum hose connector of the vacuum diaphragm. As long as you hold your finger over the hole, the diaphragm stem shouldn't budge. If it does, the unit's leaking and should be replaced. I'd like to pass on a tip or two on the vacuum diaphragm kick mechanism used on this Stromberg carburetor. Don't ever bend this wire spring or you'll upset the calibration of the vacuum kick mechanism. That tab with a square hole in it is there to protect the spring from getting bent accidentally. Another thing, make sure the choke diaphragm link is installed on the correct side of the wire spring. If the rod is installed between the spring and the end of the slot, the spring will get bent and choke operation will be all wrong. Good advice, Tech. I make it a rule to eyeball the wire spring to see if it is straight and properly positioned before I work on a 65 Stromberg. <laughs> By eyeballing, uh, Norm simply means to use your eye to see if the spring's straight. Have you noticed the big improvement in engine performance during warm-up on the 65 models? Yeah. The fast idle speed gradually decreases as the engine warms up. Whereas on past models, fast idle seems to gradually increase during warm-up and then suddenly drop back to curb idle. Correct fast idle speed adjustment is very important because it establishes the correct position of the fast idle cam with respect to the choke. Don't overlook the importance of precise fast idle adjustment, particularly in cold weather. Do adjust curb idle and the idle mixture first before you attempt to adjust fast idle. If the idle mixture is off, fast idle and warm-up performance will not be right. Here's a good rule for setting idle mixture and idle speed. With engine fully warmed up, adjust to get the best lean mixture setting and the highest specified idle speed. This will give you the best all-around performance and economy. You can also minimize stalling due to icing by setting idle speed at the high limit, mixture on the lean side, and fast idle right on the specified button. Here's why. Ice forming between the edge of the throttle blade and the carburetor body chokes off the air and causes stalls. Now. If idle speed is adjusted to the high limit, the opening between the blade and the carburetor body will be wider. As a result, it'll take a lot more ice to choke off the airflow completely. Furthermore, because icing reduces airflow, it increases the richness of the mixture. If the idle mixture is on the lean rather than the rich side to begin with, it'll tolerate a lot more enrichment due to icing without stalling. While we're on the subject of icing, Carburetor icing and stalling during warm-up is apt to be a real serious problem if the manifold heat control valve isn't free. A shot of Mopar or Crico manifold heat control valve solvent on the valve shaft is good cold weather performance insurance. The carburetors on all engines equipped with closed crankcase ventilation are calibrated to match the controlled vacuum bleed provided by the crankcase vent valve. If the crankcase vent valve is plugged, the idle mixture will be too rich, causing rough engine idle. This will also aggravate stalling due to carburetor icing. If the vent valve gets stuck open, the idle mixture will be too lean for smooth idle and good low-speed engine performance. In other words, make sure the vent valve is free. If it isn't, it should be replaced. That's a good point, Tech, and here's another. Float level adjustment and complete carburetor overhaul certainly can't be considered as seasonal services. Unless high mileage on the car or a specific complaint calls for checking float level, don't take the carburetor off or disassemble it. Do test the accelerator pump discharge by opening the throttle quickly by hand. A solid, continuous stream indicates that the plunger and the valve are probably okay. On two or four barrel carburetors, the two discharge streams should be about the same. It's also a good idea to check the accelerator pump stroke and adjust it to specifications if it isn't right. Correct pump stroke is important in connection with acceleration performance in any weather. Well, that takes care of winter service highlights on the carburetor. Now, I'd like to put in a word or two on seasonal cooling system and lubrication service. Now, these items uh, should be Oh, there, Norman. We've just about run out of time on this record. 
So I guess they'll have to open their reference books and find out what you were about to say on cooling and lubrication service. As a matter of fact, I wish all you out there would think about the service tips Marty and Norm have covered today and take time to read your reference books. I'm sure that even the best of you will pick up a tip or two that'll help you do a better job. Don't ever forget, a lot of people are depending on you master technicians to keep them rolling, keep them happy, and keep them buying Chrysler-built cars and trucks. Makes you feel important, doesn't it?